Time's up. So, sorry about it. Don't take extra time. That's not fair for us. Huh? Okay. Start leaving. I can't take extra time. That's not fair to others. Okay, folks. Don't do that again. Uh, or oh, you can leave it on my desk. My oh, door's open. Okay, folks. Um, Let's get started. On that quiz, there was a long way to do every problem and a short way to do every problem. And as I was walking around, what I was noticing that many of you chose the long way in every single one of the problems. Okay? And here's what I mean by the long way and the short way. And the first problem, who, whose quiz is that right now? On every problem, basically, if you take the first problem, I gave you the net present value, right? I gave you the life of the project, but I gave you nothing else about the project. But I told you the three things that you needed to fix. The first was that there was an allocated GNA that should not have been in there. Holding all else constant, what's that doing to your cash flows? It's pushing your cash flows down, so you've got to reverse it, right? How do you reverse an expense that should not be in there? What do you do? You take 1 minus t of that expense and take the present value. So it's an annuity. Second, I told you depreciation was ignored. What effect does depreciation have on your cash flows? It's a tax effect. On it. So the tax rate times the depreciation for 10 years, that's done. Third, I told you that he ignored the working capital investment, which was upfront and at the end. The reason I'm not giving you numbers is because you have two different quizzes and the numbers are different in each one. But what's the effect of ignoring working capital? If you're putting in 100 in front and getting back 100 at the end, there is still an effect, right? Which is the present value effect. So three present value effects, two annuities and one single cash flow. You add them up, you're done with the net present value. You could also do it the long way. And here's what the long way would require. You could take the net present value and try to solve for the annuity that gives you the net present value. So you could come up with the cash flow. Then you could try to fix the whole cash flow. You will get the same answer, but it'll take you five times, four times as long. Okay? When you, this entire quiz was incremental in that sense. No part of any problem required the previous part. So if you look at the second question, I actually thought about becoming a tennis pro when I was 18. I used to play a lot of tennis. I used to teach tennis. And then I discovered they didn't get paid very well and work like dogs, and I decided not to become one. <laughs> 
This club was actually very generous with its tennis pro. Not only did they give them a fixed salary, but they also let them keep 40% of the lessons. Usually tennis pros get, a, get to keep a portion, but it's never 40%. It's more like 10%. So the first part was a conventional. Come up with the cash flows, and there are relatively few items. So you just, you know. And then part B said, because you're having these tennis lessons, your surfaces are getting worn out faster, so you've got to invest earlier rather than later. So that looks a lot like those excess capacity problems. The only difference was in this case you had to invest in your 3 and 8 or 2 and 7 or whatever it is versus your 5. It's the same process, the present value difference. And the third part of the problem, the only thing I'm checking for is I gave you the after-tax earnings from the equipment sales, right? You got to discount them back over the life. All I'm checking to see is if you're using the right discount rate, which would be the cost of capital for equipment companies rather than you know, so that's so that so you can do 2a and 2b without uh, 2b and 2c without doing 2a because all it's asking you is for the incremental effect it's not asking you what's the net present value what's the effect on the net present value and the reason I do that is if you screw up part a I don't want that residue to carry over into b and c which it will if I ask you what's the total net present value so the incremental effects, so even if you got 2A wrong, if you got 2B and 2C right, you should still get full credit. Problem three was well, basically we're selling off a division, right? So that was pretty straightforward. You're getting cash up front. The one tricky part was when you sold it, you were selling it at below your book value, so I gave you a tax benefit of 25% of that loss. So that's your cash flow today. If you decided to wait a year to give, it's, it's okay. I'll, I'll live with any assumption you made, but basically it's simplest to take the tax benefit right away. So that's your, what you're getting by selling. The question asked was, how high do your cash flows have to be for you to not sell? Which means the present value of your cash flows has to be greater than whatever you could gain by selling it. Okay. I made this a uh, mature company, so you had growth rate of 2% a year forever. There again, I threw two different costs of capital at you. And the cost of capital you'd use to value the logistics division would be the cost of capital of logistics companies. And you'd solve for whatever that, so basically you've got the value, you've got the discount rate, the growth rate, the only number you don't know is the cash flow. You'd solve for it. Okay? So as always, here's what I'm going to do. So the quizzes are being graded, you know, alphabetically sorted right now. I'll start grading once the class starts ends and then I'll keep grading till it's done and then you'll get an email saying it's ready to be picked up. Probably around midday tomorrow it should be out there in again in stacks face down. So just um, so now that I've completely and totally depressed you. <laughs> okay. Remember the one thing you do get out of the investment analysis section is uh, at least this acceptance of a sunk cost Okay. This is now a sunk cost. <laughs> and we know what we say about sunk costs. Let them go, right? Thinking about the last quiz is not going to make it better. So if you continue to think about it for the next 50 minutes, you might ruin your next quiz. So this is all incremental. So drawing on that incremental process, let's go back to where we left off on Monday. We were talking about the trade-off between debt and equity. Tax benefits added discipline on one side. Expected bankruptcy cost, expected agency cost, and loss of future flexibility. But much of what we said in the last session was completely qualitative. When you take your company and you start to make this trade off, you're going to say, on the one hand, on the other hand, on the one hand, I have a high tax rate, on the other hand, I have expected bankruptcy cost. And you're going to, in a sense, talk yourself into a corner. So today we're going to talk specifics, and we're going to. Look at the right mix, and we're trying to get. We're going to try to come up with a number for a company: 30 percent, 50 percent, 70 percent, 90 percent. How do you come up with that right mix? And we're going to go through a series of different tools for arriving at it. So the tool we're going to talk about today is actually a tool we've been using a lot in ca in corporate finance, which is the cost of capital. But we're going to use it in a different way. We're going to look for that mix of debt and equity that minimizes the cost of capital for a company. There are only two ingredients in the cost of capital, right? Cost of equity, cost of debt. We're going to come up with a mix that minimizes the cost of capital and argue that that is the optimal mix. So called the conventional cost of capital approach. I'm also going to tell you the assumptions we make with that approach, and some of them are daunting. 
So the second approach is kind of a refined version of the cost of capital approach. I call it the enhanced cost of capital approach, where you bring in expected indirect bankruptcy costs. You know what indirect bankruptcy costs are? If you're in trouble, your customers start buying, stop buying your product, your supply. Your operating income itself could be impacted by your rating and your debt ratio. So we're going to bring that in the second approach. The third approach is called the adjusted present value approach, a vastly misused approach in practice. I've seen practitioners use it in really bad ways. We'll talk about how to do it right, what often gets missed in practice, and how we can fix that missing bit. Fourth, we're going to talk about how I think, and this is just my bias, how I think most companies set their debt ratios. They look at everybody else in the sector, they look at what everybody else is borrowing, and they try to stay as close as they can to that average. And it's amazing how much of corporate finance is driven by being close to the average. And we'll talk about what drives CFOs of companies, otherwise sensible people to do this, and why it would remain the dominant way in which most companies think about how much should I borrow. And the final approach we've already talked about. You tell me where you are in the life cycle. I'll kind of tell you how much debt you have to have. So basically, five different approaches. Let's start with the cost of capital approach. Sorry. We've used the cost of capital as a hurdle rate, right? Investment analysis. We said you have to earn more than the cost of capital in order to invest in a project. And that's actually a very big use for the cost of capital in corporate finance. But in the other class that I've been teaching, simultaneously the valuation class, the cost of capital has been playing a different role. When I value a business, a company, right, the value of a company is the present value of the cash flows generated by that company discounted back at the cost of capital. So think of the capital budgeting project and expand it to include an entire company. So if I'm writing the value of a firm, I've expected cash flows from the firm in the numerator. So after CapEx, working capital, what are the cash flows? And I discount those cash flows back at the company's cost of capital. And what I get as a present value is the value of the operating assets of the company. So hold on to that equation. You've got cash flows in the numerator from the company and the cost of capital of the company in the denominator. If I hold the cash flows fixed, and that's an assumption I'm going to make at least in this initial run, and I lower my cost of capital, same cash flows, lower discount rate, what's going to happen to my value? Same cash flows, lower discount rate, the value is going to go up, right? And at the limit, if I minimize my cost to capital, I've maximized my value. You're saying, so what? That's the objective in corporate finance, I thought. Maximize the value of the business, and if you're true to that objective, you should find a mix of debt and equity that minimizes your cost to capital. That's really the cost to capital approach. So do the cost of a capital approach Let's first recap very quickly what goes into a cost of capital. I know we've just finished this, and you don't need a recap, but no harm recapping anyway. Two ingredients, cost of equity, cost of debt. The cost of equity is what your equity investors demand for investing in the equity in your company. You build up to it from a risk-free rate and adding on a, an equity risk premium and the beta for your company. So far, we've used project, but basically for the entire company. So as you borrow more money, the beta will go up, the cost of equity will also go up. The cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money today, not the rate at which you borrowed money two years ago. And to build up to that, we started with the risk-free rate and added the default spread. That default spread either came from looking at your actual rating or your synthetic rating. So those are the two ingredients. Then we threw in the fact that the tax law is tilted towards debt by netting out the tax benefit from debt the weighted average of that cost of equity and after-tax cost of debt was our cost of capital. I know this is repeating something we've done a dozen times, but this is going to be the vehicle we're going to use to come up with the optimal mix. But before we do that, let's do one final thing about the cost of capital and let it pass. Okay? I kind of brought this up in the context of when we talked about the cost of equity. And it talked about the CFO who said his equity was really cheap because he said his cost of equity was only 1% because that's what the dividend yield was. Let's make sure we get that nailed down. The cost of equity is not just your dividend yield. It's your dividend yield plus your price appreciation. So even though you pay no dividends, doesn't mean equity is free for you. In fact, especially if you pay no dividends, you probably have a very high cost of equity because you're probably a young, risky, high-growth company. So cost of equity reflects not just what you pay out in dividends, but that expected price appreciation. And the more risk there is in your equity, the higher your cost of equity. But we define risk in a very specific way, risk that cannot be diversified away. It's not just how risky you are, but how much of that risk is market risk. 
The cost of debt is the rate at which you can borrow money today, given your default. So I have a, actually a question that seems obvious and easy to answer, but actually has a little twist to it. For any company, can the cost of debt at a particular debt ratio be higher than the cost of equity? You see what I'm asking? I know across companies, some companies' cost of debt can be higher than other companies. But for the same company, can the cost of debt, make, let's make it pre-tax, you know, forget about the tax effect. Can the cost of debt be higher than the cost of equity? Think through what goes into each. Cost of debt is affected by your default risk, right? Cost of equity is driven by market risk. If the debt increases your risk of default? It will always for so every company. Your leverage so far that you think that's the risk is higher? So let, you play the role of a lender. So let's say you're lending to me. I am an oil company in serious trouble. So you're going to charge me 17%, 18%, 20%, right? The equity guy in my company is right behind you in line. You see what I'm saying is if you're charging 18%, the equity guy has to wait till you get paid. So if you're charging 18%, he's going to charge more than 18%. So even in that extreme scenario, we have lots of debt. The cost of equity, cost of debt might be huge, but the cost of equity is going to be even higher. Uh, there is one exception. Let's see if you can find that. Well, at, at that stage, it is possible that if you try to borrow money, your cost of debt would be stratospheric because your default risk is basically infinite. So that could be one exception. I wasn't even thinking of that one. I'll give you a clue. Gold mining company. What do we say drives the cost of equity? The risk in the equity. We define it, that risk as risk you cannot diversify away. If you're a company whose bulk of your risk, your equity risk is firm specific, a, a young biotechnology company, a gold mining company, it's entirely possible that your cost of equity could be low even though you're a risky company because most of the risk will get diversified away in somebody's portfolio. However, if you're lending to this company, you don't care that the risk can be diversified away. You've got to get paid. Default risk is not a diversifiable feature that you can call on when you're a bank. So that is the only exception. File that away for that trick question you want to ask when you come back to torture other people by interviewing them. <laughs> so I ask them, can the cost of equity ever be lower than the cost of debt? That's the only place. A publicly traded company where the bulk of the risk comes from the firm rather than the market. Somebody back there had a hand up. I'm sorry, I preempted you. What is it? That's basically it. Very low market risk, but translating your beta. I'm sorry, I should have let you give the answer, and no, but I jumped in. Yeah. Uh, is it not possible to diversify some of that debt cost related to I'll tell you what, the problem with default risk is when do people default? When they're in trouble. And you get in trouble when the economy does badly. So default risk doesn't have that nice feature of you default when nobody else is defaulting. That might happen but it happens so unusually. And that's why when you look at loan defaults, they tend to either all happen or not happen at all. Is there's a very high correlation across companies when they default. Okay. So that's the only exception, but that's, those are the two components. So to compute the cost of capital at every debt ratio, I need a cost of equity at every debt ratio and a cost of debt at every debt ratio. So let me set the table on how I'm going to try to do this. And you're going to see, did I get this right? Yeah. You're going to see why this can be a little problematic in practice. I'm going to show you a table that is actually 36 years old. You say, why are you aging tables? It's actually a table I was shown in my very first corporate finance class. And it was in the context of talking about optimal capital structure. And I'll have to tell you, even before I talk about the table, that this did not work with my class. And we'll talk about why, because this is the way capital structure is usually framed in the textbooks. So instructor walks in and says, today we're going to talk about the optimal mix of debt and equity for a company. And we're going to use XYZ widget company, which already should have given us a clue. But the guy did not want to talk about anything real. I've never understood, what's this thing about widget companies when you have 10,000 real companies out there? But you know what the nice thing about widget companies is if you're an instructor? Nobody's never seen a widget. So if you give the widget company a high beta, I can't complain, so widgets are not discretionary. How do you know? You've never seen a widget. So it's the XYZ widget company, here's the table. Today we're going to talk about the optimal mix of debt and equity. 
So he set the table up and he went down column by column and with each column the story he said actually made sense. So basically what he has is a table where the debt ratio goes from 0 to 100 percent. There's actually a problem there. Your debt ratio can never be 100 percent. And here's what. What's the definition of equity? You bear the residual risk, right? Whatever's left over. If debt holders hold everything, that's like being equity investors in the company. Somebody's, so that we cut him some slack. Maybe 99% debt, 1% equity. So very close to 100%. Then he gave us the cost of equity story. He said, as the company borrows more money, its equity is going to get riskier. Why? Because your earnings are going to get more volatile as equity earnings. You're big. Made sense. But then some guy in the front row, wasn't me, put up his hand and said, why is it going up the way it is? You see what, what made us suspicious? It went from 10 and a half to 11. It went up by 0 0.5, then 0 0.6, then 0 0.7. To be quite frank, it looked like he had made up the numbers. He said, don't worry about the numbers. As long as you get the principle, that's all that matters. Let's move on. So we moved on. Then he got to the cost of debt. He told us a second story. He said, as you borrow more money, your default risk is going to go up. Banks are going to charge you higher interest rates. And again, the story made sense. Again, the same guy in the front row. But up says, but why is it going up the way it is? Again, frankly, it looked like he'd made up the numbers. He said, don't worry about the numbers as long as you get the principle. Let's move on. Then he took that cost of debt multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate. We could see what he was doing. And then he took a weighted average in the last column. And he said, the optimal debt ratio for this company, or the second to last column, is 40% debt. Why? Because as you look down the numbers, you want the minimum cost of capital and it's minimized at 40%. He said, let's move on. And people were not quite ready to move on. And after a while, he was convinced we were just dim. So he said, let me show it to you in a different way. In case you're not getting this, it must be because you're stupid. Here's your optimal. See the low point on the graph? That is your optimal cost of capital. He was missing the point. We saw exactly what he was doing. We saw exactly why 40% was optimal. What we did not get was, how do you get this table for a company? Because think about it. I know you're not caught up on the project, but I think I am with my five companies. How many points on this graph do I know for Disney right now? I mean, I've been working with Disney for, with Disney for the last eight weeks of classes, right? I know one point on this graph. Which point do I know? I know the existing cost of capital. I don't have a graph, I have a point. And in fact, when you walk into a company, that's all you have is your one observation, the existing debt ratio, existing cost of capital. Your job is to extrapolate from that one point to the rest of the graph. And that's what troubled me the most about textbook chapters in corporate finance. They all had this nice U-shaped cost of capital. They all said, go to the low point of the graph. And then you had people go out and say, well, how do I get the graph? And people said, well, that's up to you. So what we're going to actually do is to try to come up with a way to flesh out the rest of the graph. And I'm going to use Disney. Might as well use a company we've been working with. And I'm going to use Disney to try to extrapolate the rest of the graph. But remember the one point that we know? Might as well get that point nailed down for Disney before we get too ambitious, right? So here's what Disney looks like now. Disney right now is about 84% equity, 16% debt. We worked through that when we came up with the So this is their existing mix of debt and equity and their existing cost of capital. So if you look at Disney right now, we've computed, this is the cost of capital we've been using for Disney up till now. So at its existing debt ratio, the cost of capital is 7.81%. What's the question we're asking with the optimal capital structure? Is this the right mix for Disney? Or another way to frame that question is, if I change the debt ratio for Disney from what it is today to some other number, 20%, 30%, 40%, could I end up with a cost of capital lower than 7.81%, right? That's basically what I'm asking. So to do that, I need a cost of equity, not just the existing debt ratio, but at every debt ratio from 0 to 90%. I need a cost of debt, not just to the existing debt ratio, but at every debt ratio from 0 to 90%. And if I can do that, I could create a table that looks a lot like the XYZ widget table, right? But I could do it for Disney, and I could back up each number. It's a little unfair, because the way I've structured this is to get ready for this table. Because the way I've computed cost of equity and cost of debt for Disney allows me to do the extrapolation. And let's see why. When I did the cost of equity for Disney, I came up with the beta for Disney, right? Do you remember where that beta came from, the 
I know you don't, but five businesses, I took a weighted average, I came up with an unlevered beta for the company. And then I applied the debt to equity ratio for the company to come up with a levered beta and a cost of equity, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take that unlevered beta, and I'm going to try different debt ratios, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 95%. And I'm going to end up with a levered beta at every debt ratio. And guess what? The levered beta is going to climb as my debt ratio climbs and my cost of equity. So I'm going to have that cost of equity column. That's the easy half of the equation. To get a cost of debt for Disney, I used their rating. They were a rated company. So when I first started doing this, I tried something I didn't work for me. Maybe it'll work for you. I created this table of debt ratios, and I faxed it. And those, those are there. You couldn't email it. Yet. I faxed it to a student of mine who worked at S&P and said, can you fax me back the ratings you would give Disney at all these different debt ratios? He faxed it back two minutes later, exactly the way I faxed it, and saying, you do it, and then we'll tell you. And that's the problem. Ratings agencies are not going to telegraph what the rating for a company is going to be at hypothetical debt ratios. So I was a little stuck until I came up with the synthetic rating approach. The synthetic rating approach, what do I do? I compute the interest coverage ratio, right? Earnings before interest and taxes divided by interest expense. So as I borrow more money, what's going to happen to my interest expense? It's going to go up. As my interest expense goes up, my coverage ratio is going to decrease. I go to the lookup table. I look up the rating. And guess what? My rating is going to go from double A, single A. In other words, I'm going to be able to come up with the rating for your company at every conceivable debt ratio. And as you get to higher debt ratios, your rating is going to drop. Your cost of debt is going to increase. I'm going to check and make sure you get the tax benefits still. You see what I mean by check? Because you can have interest expense, but if you don't have the income to cover it, I can't give you a tax benefit. And then I'm going to be able to come up with the cost of debt at every debt ratio. So that's where I'm going with this. And you're going to see a table at the end that looks exactly like the XYZ widget company. I'm going to look to see where the cost of capital is minimized. And that's the right mix of debt and equity for Disney as a company. So let's get started with the easier half of the equation. Let's start with the data that we already have for Disney. We have the unlevered beta for Disney that we did uh, 200 pages ago. Right? We broke them down to five businesses, came up with the unlevered beta, took a weighted average. The unlevered beta for Disney as a company, as, in terms of its operating assets, is 0.9239. If you don't have a bottom-up beta, you'd have to take your regression beta and unlever it and come up with an unlevered beta. Not a particularly optimal choice, given how noisy, but you need an unlevered beta. So that, is the unlev that would be the beta if Disney had no debt. So it actually fills out the 0% column is now done, right? Because at 0% debt, you'll have unlevered beta, cost of equity, no debt. Your cost of capital is nailed down. That, ba that unlevered beta is going to be the basis for coming up with my beta at every other debt ratio. To get the cost of debt, we'll, we'll need how much operating income you have. So to do that, I went back and looked at the last 12 months for Disney. In fact, I looked at both the most recent fiscal year and the, and the previous year so that I you know, make sure that I wasn't catching some unusual year because you have a really good year. I don't want to borrow based on a really bad year. So in this case, the operating income that Disney had in the most recent year was about $10.03 billion. It did not look unusual. You say, how do you know? Well, if it had been $2 billion the previous year, jumped to $10 billion, I'd have been a little wary about using the number. If it was 50 billion and dropped to 10 billion, I'd have said maybe I shouldn't use the number. But it looked okay. When you look at your company, you might make a different judgment. Say, I don't want to use the last year's numbers. I want to use an average of the last five. If you're working with an oil company, it's going to be particularly dangerous to use last year's income to borrow money today. Because last year's income was based on a $75 oil price. You go out and borrow money on that basis, you're going to be bankrupt sooner rather than later. So the income that I'm going to use is the 10,032. So let's start with the beta. So this is a table we did way back when we talked about levered betas. I'm using the beta, the levered beta equation. Basically, I have the unlevered beta 0.9239. So when I have no debt, that's my levered beta. And as my debt ratio climbs, my debt to equity ratio goes up. So I've given you the beta for Disney from everything from no debt to a leveraged buyout, Disney. That levered beta is giving me a cost of equity. 
To get that cost of equity, I take the same risk-free rate and the same equity risk premium. Those don't change because those are market-driven numbers. All that's changing is the beta that I use. And guess what? For, for Disney, the cost of equity is going to be 8.07% if they have no debt, and as high as 38.69% if they have 90% debt. So if my objective in capital structure is to minimize my cost of equity, you don't even have to do the analysis, right? How much debt should you have if your objective is to have the lowest cost of equity you can? Have no debt, you're done. So that can never be your objective in capital structure. The question is, am I gaining when I go to a higher debt ratio? And how can you be gaining? Your cost of equity is going up. Well, I'm replacing more expensive equity with cheaper debt, and that's the trade-off we're trying to capture in the cost of capital. So this is the easy half of the equation, getting the beta. And if you have the unlevered beta for your company, you can work through that number. Now let's talk about the cost of debt. It's a little messy. It's not difficult, but it's a little tedious. So I'm going to take you by hand through a single debt ratio. You're saying as opposed to what? I'm going to give you an Excel spreadsheet. We enter the numbers, it'll do it for you. But I don't want it to become a black box. So I want to show you what happens behind the spreadsheet when you enter the numbers. So what am I trying to do? I have to compute an interest coverage ratio and use the coverage ratio to come up with a rating and use the rating to come up with an interest rate, right? So I picked a debt ratio, 10% debt. I have to figure out what the rating and cost of debt would be for Disney at that 10% debt ratio. So to get the process started, here's what I did. I took the existing market value of equity and the existing market value of debt, both of which we estimated way back in time, added them up and came up with a total value of about $137.8 billion. So that is the total value of Disney's operating assets. You're saying, why do you need that? Because to get to a 10% debt ratio, I need, first need to figure out how much I need to borrow, right? The value of the business is 137839 10% of that is $13,784 million. So that's my first stop, is figuring out what the dollar debt's going to be at a 10% debt ratio. So I've gone from no debt to 10% debt by borrowing 13784 I already know what my EBITDA da and EBITDA are right now, right? They're 12005 so that's not affected by my debt. I'm going to assume that those numbers don't change when I go out and you say, how can they not change? If you're borrowing 13.78 billion, that money must be going somewhere, right? It is going somewhere, but it's not going into projects or assets because if I do that, I have two things to worry about. My capital structure is changing and I'm taking new investments. I'm gonna assume that whatever you raise in new debt, whatever comes in through one door, leaves through another door, it goes to the equity investors. In what way? Either as a dividend, or by buying back stock. It's called a recapitalization. It's a way in which people assess capital structure because they're trying to isolate the effect of financing. Because if I let that money get invested, then at the net present value of the projects I take, you know, murky, making the, so that effectively means that my EBITDA, DA, and EBIT are going to stay the same because I'm not taking any more projects. I'm just using the, the debt I raise to bring down equity. So that's a recapitalization effect. Then I get to my first big number. I need an interest expense, right? To get an interest expense, all I need to do is take the dollar debt, 13,784, and multiply by the interest rate. I get an interest expense of 434 million. I'm almost home. If I take the operating income of 10,032 million and divide by the 434 million interest expense, I come up with an interest coverage ratio of 23.1. And if you turn to the next page, here's my table. 23.1 interest coverage ratio, Look at the table, it gives me a AAA rating and a cost of debt of 3.15%. <coughs> Let me go back to the previous page. I'll list the five steps out. There's actually a flaw, a fatal flaw, some might think, in the process I'm going to use. Tell me where you find the flaw. I start off with the dollar debt, right? 13,784. I multiply the dollar debt by the interest rate to come up with the interest expense, step two. I divide the operating income by the interest expense to come up with the coverage ratio, step three. I use the interest coverage ratio to come up with a rating, step four. I use the rating to come up with an interest rate, step five. Where's the problem here? In fact, the second step, what do I need? I need an interest rate which I don't get till step five. This is like a chicken and the egg problem, right? I don't think that has a known solution, but this one does. Here's what I'm going to do. When I first estimate the interest expense, I'm going to act like the interest rate I used to have before I borrow the money is still going to apply. Completely unrealistic, but I'm going to come up with an interest expense. 
I know it's too low. I'm going to compute a coverage ratio based on that interest expense. I'm going to come up with a rating and a cost of debt. And guess what? It's probably going to be higher than what I've used for my interest expense. You see, that's, you can't allow that to happen. You're right. So I go back and recompute the interest expense, which is going to push up the interest expense, push down the coverage ratio, and I'm going to go look at the table again. Maybe it's changed again. I have to do it again. In fact, the Excel spreadsheet that you will get that does this comes with, if you, if you open it for some of you, it'll say there's circular reasoning. You know how Excel goes crazy when there's circular reasoning? Don't try to fix it. It's a feature, not a bug. You need it for this to work because that's all you're doing is, do and in fact, if any of you have trouble, you go to the calculation options, there's an iteration box, check that. Without it, the, the spreadsheet will not work. But that's basically what I'm doing, and I'll give you an example of how this would work by taking the 30% debt ratio. Okay? So if you have a pencil, you can go along with me because we're going to compute the synthetic rating for Disney at a 30% debt ratio using exactly the same process we used at a 10% debt ratio. So I've given you the 20%. So let's say I've done the 20% already, so you already have it. So I come to the 30% debt ratio. First question I ask you is, what's the debt to equity ratio going to be if my debt ratio is 30%? We did this in the review session yesterday. 30 is your debt, 70 is your equity, 30 divided by 70 is going to give you about 42%. So let's round it down, the debt to equity ratio of roughly 42%. So everybody comfortable with that? That was the easy part. At a 30% debt ratio, I'm going to have more debt, right? So at 20%, the debt, the amount of debt I have is 27,568. At 30%, I'm going to have $13,784 million in additional debt, which I think works out to $41,432. You can, you can check it. Basically, it's thir so basically, it's another 13000 So each, each step I take is $13,784 million. We, we worked that out in the first step. So if you add that on, you have roughly $41.3 billion in debt. So you've gone from... 27.6 billion in debt to almost 41 billion dollars in debt. Then there are three numbers that we are almost gimmies. What's the EBITDA down EBIT going to be? Remember what we assume, when you borrow money, nothing happens to your project, you're not taking more. So the EBITDA down and EBIT are going to be the same as they were at a 20% debt ratio. So you can copy the 12,517 the 2485 and the 10,032 down. Now do you see where you're going to get stuck? Now I ask you what the interest expense is. If you look below there, there's nothing there. There's no interest rate yet. So what do we suggest you should do? Go back to the interest rate you used to have, completely unrealistic, the 3.15%. If you take 3.15% of your 41.3 billion in new debt, the total interest expense you're going to have is going to be 1,302 million. So basically, your interest expense increases proportionately because your interest rate stays the same. I know it's completely unrealistic, but hang in there for the moment. So you've got 1,302 as your interest expense. You've got 10,032 as, uh, as your operating income. You divide the operating income by that interest expense, 10,032 by 1,302. I think you get an interest coverage ratio of 7.7. You turn to the next page, and you turn to the next page, here's what you see as your, I'm sorry, the previous page. 7.7 interest coverage ratio gives me, what is the rating? Double A, and the cost of debt I have is 3.45%. Do, do you see the problem I'm going to have now? The interest rate I used to come up with the 1302 million was, 3.15%, and now I'm telling you I've changed my mind. It's really 3.45%. That's why there's a second iteration. The second iteration, what do you do? You keep the same dollar debt, but you now multiply by 3.45%. You come up with an interest expense that's about 1368 million, much higher because the interest rate is higher. The interest expense goes up, the coverage ratio drops. It drops from 7.7 down to about 7. Then you very gingerly turn back to the previous page and hope and pray. What hasn't happened? That you haven't slipped another notch, in which case you've got to do a third iteration. In this case, I just got lucky. When I went back to the previous page and I looked up seven, 
It still is a AA rated company. And because it's still a AA rated company, I'm done. That's the definition of done in this process is the interest rate you've used to come up with the interest expense matches up to the interest rate you tell me you have at the debt ratio. You're done. So you could actually conceivably sit there with a ledger sheet and a slide rule. Has anybody ever used a slide rule? You don't even need a calculator. And you could compute the optimal debt ratio or even an abacus or whatever. So you don't need, I mean, this doesn't need massive com computational power and come up with the optimal debt ratio for a company in maybe four and a half to five hours. See, that's a lot of time. It's a $130 billion company. I don't know how much you value your time at, but four hours to optimize the capital structure is not that long. Luckily, with an Excel spreadsheet with the iteration box checked, so here's what it asks you in the iteration box. How many iterations do you want me to do? How many do we do? Two. In Excel, it's set for 1,000 iterations. Complete overkill, because everything after the second iteration, you're just spinning around doing nothing. But it seems to cost it nothing. So that's what it does. In each debt ratio, it spins around until it converges on an interest rate that matches up to the interest rate you've used. And it keeps going, because it doesn't know when to stop. But at the end of every iterative process, you have a cost of debt that reflects the interest expense you have. So it's a consistent cost of debt. And that's effectively how I ended up with the cost of debt for Disney at every debt ratio from 0 to 90%. So this is the process that I just went through. 10%, 20 You've got to go through sequentially. If you're doing it by hand, start with 0, then go 10, 20, because you need the previous levels, cost of debt, to get the next level done. There's my cost of debt. So let's look at the characteristics. As you borrow more money, your interest coverage ratio decreases. No surprise there. As the interest coverage ratio decreases, your rating, which starts at AAA, goes to AA, BBB, et cetera, and this collapses by the time you get to 90% debt. As your rating collapses, your interest rate climbs, because the default rate is much higher. The only thing that is a little twisty is once you get past about 60% debt, notice the tax rate starts to decrease. You know why? What, how do you, the interest expense actually starts to get bigger than your operating income, at which point I say, hey, sorry guys, you have maxed out your tax benefit, I start taking away your tax benefit. What you see in the last column is my after-tax cost of debt. It starts tiny and by the time I'm done, it's at 10.33%. You think that's really high, but remember the cost of equity is what, 36 point something percent. So when you're at a 90% debt ratio, both numbers are high because they reflect the fact that you are a massively over levered company. So here's the final slide and then we'll end for the day. Let me show you how I adjust the tax rate. The operating income they have is 10,032 million. That's the most you're going to be able to claim in tax benefits. Once you get there, you're done. I take that and I, so if your interest expense is less than that number, that's the check I run, I give you the full tax benefit. Once the interest expense exceeds that number, then I cap the tax benefit at 10,032 because you can't subtract more than that. I give you the tax benefit on the 10,032, but it's now a smaller percentage than 36.1% of your overall interest expense. When I've done this with LBO guys, they complain that I'm not allowing them to carry forward losses. You're right. And I don't want you to do an LBO on the assumption that you can carry losses forward to get some benefit in the future. This isn't some unusual year. You borrowed too much. This is not a problem that's going to go away quickly. So I agree it's conservative, but I want to be conservative when I get to those really high debt ratios because otherwise I'll be counting tax benefits I might never be collecting. So when we start next session, I'm going to show you the cost of capital schedule from the cost of equity and cost of debt we've computed. But I will see you on Monday.
You take 10 bonds and put them together. You can do the same thing that you do with one bond. You take 100 bonds and a bank loan and put them together. It's all cash flow at the end. Yeah. But if you're on the inside doing interest expenses for a company, you don't take in real time some number because most of these are bank loans have actual interest payments and so forth. And you just add up the interest expenses, right? So it's debit credit, right? You talk as an interest expense, you need debit and credit. That's how you do it. It's just a cash flow. Well, I think there are two. There, if it's not too different, you're okay with it because that's the existing debt ratio. Otherwise, there are a couple of things you can do to fix it. One is when you do the optimal capital structure, you can do it entirely with synthetic ratings and say, if I get an optimal there, the difference I have is going to be across the board. So basically, it's like moving your cost yeah. of capital graph up and down. So basically, that's the simplest solution is for, even though you have an actual rating, when I do Disney's optimal, I'm going to do it entirely with synthetic ratings. Find an optimal there and then make that judgment that if I switch to actual ratings across the board, yeah. that I will either be up two notches higher than I should be a lower two notches. Or you can build it explicitly into the spreadsheet. Take the existing rating and the synthetic rating, take that difference and take every synthetic rating you get across from zero to 90% and move it by that difference. So if you're two notches lower, then lower everything by two notches, right? So a triple A will become a single A, a single A will become a double B. So that'll then take care of that, that disconnect and give you ratings that actually mean something. For, for the first part of the project, I should use official one rather than the synthetic. For the, cost, for the existing cost of capital, always use the actual rating. And right now, when the airline goes. Yeah, so that can happen, yeah. Hey, how are you? Doing all right. I had a question about the, when you do the iterations of the mm -hmm. cost of debt, conceptually I'm thinking when you change the cost of debt, that changes your discount factor that you would use in a valuation. There's actually a second iteration you can run on the value of the firm. Here, one thing right. I'm doing is I'm saying 10% of the value yeah. of the firm, I'm keeping the value of the firm right. fixed for today's value. And that's what I was... You can create a second iteration where your value itself gets redone using yeah. the cost of capital. Does that really make much of a difference? It doesn't make much of a difference it and would. it makes your Excel spreadsheet incredibly yeah. finicky, and right? It just makes... It the, because you have two iterations... Even with one iteration, for instance, here's a simple thing. If yeah. you enter an input wrong in yeah. Excel and you fix it, yeah. usually the spreadsheet works, but if you have an iterative iter yeah, process yeah, going, the and whole and thing goes to divide by yeah. error and you can't even get it back. Yeah. And if you create two iterations, then it gets you. I have a version of the spreadsheet that does it. Okay. I almost <laughs> never use it because it's so finicky yeah. about how it does things that it's just one step away from blowing up on you. Yeah. But you're right. In fact, the value of the business itself will change. Yeah. Yeah? But there is again, and this is a real world problem. When you go out to borrow money, you don't know yeah. what rate you will borrow. Right? Yeah. And if I ask you, what will your debt ratio be after you borrow the money, you don't yeah. know yet because the value of the firm yeah. will change as well. That's what you're confronting in the yeah. Excel spreadsheet. And you're trying your best to kind of. Well, keep I think things. specifically in the, the idea.